one. All right. Settle down, settle down, please. Grab a seat, settle down. Shut it! Okay, um, so firstly, just a sort of unrelated note to mathematics. There are a lot of empty seats here. Does anyone understand why we suddenly don't have a full class? Is Yesterday there like a test? Thursday. Yesterday was Thursday. <laughs> oh, what is? <laughs> I assume that there's some insalubrious establishment somewhere that's got cheap drinks on Thursday? Is that the? All right, okay. So, uh, what we spoke about yesterday were generating sets. And we're going to talk a little bit about generating sets today. And then in the second part of today's lecture, we'll start speaking about linear independence. We'll keep talking about linear independence when we come back on Monday. And then we'll see probably, not on Monday, on Tuesday. And then we'll see probably around Wednesday, Thursday next week that we can use the notion of generating sets and linear independence together to define um, what is going to be called a basis. And from the basis, we'll start talking about dimensions. Of, of vector spaces and dimensions of subspaces. Okay. But here's just uh, two examples to get us started today. We're speaking about generating sets. So I've got a set here. The first set is just, I guess it's the identity matrix. And I suppose that's some sort of reflection matrix. And the question is, what is the set generated by S? So take a, take a minute, try to write down the set which is generated by S, and then we'll think about the second problem. Most people have the right idea, which is that we're just going to write down something like this. We just get something like this, right? That's just the set of all linear combinations of these two vectors. It's a little bit strange in this sense because the vectors that we're talking about are, are themselves matrices. But it's these linear combinations here. And then we can maybe sort of simplify that a little bit. Suppose we might need some more space. Let's just pull this down a bit. So this is, uh, say, something like this. It'll be alpha plus beta, 0, 0, alpha minus beta. And we can maybe actually say, well, OK, we can relabel this. We can say alpha plus beta is gamma equal alpha minus beta delta. Because if alpha and beta are two real numbers, you've got the freedom to choose two different quantities here in any combination. So we'll just relabel them. And so we can see that the set generated by these two vectors, say gamma 0, 0, delta, The set generated by these two vectors will simply be the set of all diagonal matrices. We haven't defined a diagonal matrix yet, but a diagonal matrix is basically just an n, 
a, a matrix where the entries on the diagonal might be non-zero, but the other entries must be zero. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, we, we maybe have to be a little bit careful, right, in the sense that we've said alpha plus beta is equal to gamma and alpha minus beta is equal to delta. And the claim I'm making is that we start with sort of two degrees of freedom in the sense that we've got two constants, alpha and beta, and we write down, we replace them with, with gamma and delta. And the claim we're making is that really gamma and delta can be chosen arbitrarily. Um, if this was something else, if we had, uh, if at this point here this wasn't alpha minus beta, if this had been something like 2 alpha plus 2 beta, we couldn't then write down uh, 2 alpha plus 2 beta equal to delta without also realizing that gamma and delta have some sort of relationship between them. But because of the particular shape of um, this over here, right, uh, they really are independent. And I guess the way you might see that is if you wrote down these coefficients here, this matrix 1, 1, 1, minus 1, uh, you would be able to Gauss reduce that matrix into the identity matrix. Uh, if you wrote down a matrix with coefficients like that, that doesn't get Gauss reduced into the identity matrix. So yes, you're right. In, in some sense, we've got to be a little bit careful about uh, just claiming that we can rewrite these combinations as uh, some, other, some other constant. OK. So the next question. The next question is sort of slightly backwards from what we've been doing so far. The previous questions here, what we did is we started with a set and we asked, you know, what does it generate? Now we're just sort of checking something else. We're not interested in what is, we're not interested in everything that it generates. We're just wondering if it generates a set which contains one particular element, right? So this is 355, an element of the set generated by S, yes. Could we say that the set generated by these two matrices, so you want to describe this as the x and y axis? <coughs> no, I mean, it's not clear what, what I mean, this is a, a matrix, right? So how do you think that this is the x or the y axis? Okay, are you saying that this first column is what it's going to map the unit vector i hat to? Okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, but that's not, so this is maybe telling you something about where i hat and j hat will be mapped to, but this is not itself uh, a member of R2. This is a matrix which is some sort of transformation acting on R2, right? Okay, so let's just, uh, let's just start the next problem. So this, this problem over here, we want to know if we can find a linear combination of these three vectors so that the linear combination gives 3, 5, 5. So I'd like you to take a minute and try to write up, you might have to write some intermediate steps, but write up an augmented system um, which you'd be able to solve, which will tell you whether or not you'll be able to do this. And then uh, once everyone's written up the augmented system, I'll tell you what the result of Gauss reducing it would be. You can check the Gauss reduction at home. And then we'll try to conclude where, whether or not 355 is in S on the basis of that Gauss reduction. But first, set up an augmented system, right? There should be some augmented system because we're really looking for alpha 111 plus beta 423 plus gamma minus 131 is equal to 355. So we're trying to solve for these constants alpha, beta, and gamma.
this down and I'm, I'm going to show maybe more steps than you would need to uh, just because it's the first time we've done a problem like this but generally once you sort of get used to it and you can see what's going on you immediately go to the augmented system but we write down something like this we're looking for alpha 111 one, one plus beta 423 plus gamma minus 131 one is equal to 355 Right? So we can think of this as being a matrix. 1, 1, 1, 4, 2, 3, 5, 5, 1, 1, 1, 4, 2, 3, minus 1, 3, 1, multiplied by a vector, alpha, beta, gamma, is equal to 3, 5, 5. Remember that when we do matrix multiplication, we just get a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. And then we can say, oh, OK, we know how to solve systems like this. We just write down an augmented system. So we'll write down 1, 4, minus 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1. And on this side, 3, 5, 5. And then we understand that the first column is the column corresponding to alpha. The second column is the column corresponding to beta. The third column is the column corresponding to gamma. And we Gauss reduce this, and you can check the details yourself at home. But after doing the Gauss reduction, we end up with what I have is 1, 4, minus 1. And we don't actually need to do the complete Gauss reduction. You don't need to get it uh, all the way into reduced row echelon form. <laughs> as soon as it gets to this point here, <coughs> Right. As soon as it gets to this point here, which is, uh, I think, after two steps of Gauss reduction, we sort of immediately notice that there's not going to be a solution to this system, right? Because really what this third row is now telling us is that zero alpha plus zero beta plus zero gamma should be equal to negative two, right? Which is impossible. So this over here says that your system is uh, inconsistent. So we don't have any solutions. And so now the, the result of us finding no solution is basically just saying that there's no value for alpha, beta, and gamma. So that alpha times by the first vector plus beta times by the second vector plus gamma times by the third vector is equal to 355, five, right? So what that's really just telling us is that 355 five is not in the set which is generated by these three vectors. So we can write down maybe one more line here, um, which is 355. Five. Still on the set which is generated by S. Any questions about this? Okay. Well, let's. Yes. Sorry, I'm not sure if it's mathematical. Your final thing on the, the right column, that middle of minus two, I think, should be a minus one. So should that be a minus one? Uh, maybe. Ch check it. Everyone check it. Yeah. Is it a minus one? Oh, okay, fine. Damn. Oh, the. Oh, the vector. You're saying this one? Yeah. Okay, that should be a? Minus one. Minus one. Uh, okay, all right, hold on. Okay. All right, so are there any questions about what we've done over here? 
Okay, so I think we, we can maybe take a minute and try to develop some sort of intuition for what's going on here geometrically. You can't do that with, with every sort of problem, but the fact that we're working here in R3 does mean that we can sort of try to understand what's going on. You might naively think right, that if we have these three vectors in R3, and you take a linear combination of three vectors in R3, well, the first vector is going to give you a line, and now you've got a second vector that will give you a plane, and the third vector will give you a, a volume. And you should be able to reach any point in R3 with a set of three vectors. But that's not quite the case. We saw in the tut that if you've got three vectors and you take a linear combination of three vectors, you might have different things that happen, right? There might be different, uh, you might generate different subspaces depending on those three vectors. So what's going on with, what's going on with this problem? I mean, what, what sort of subspace is being generated here by those three vectors? It's definitely not all of R3. So what, el what else could it be? A plane. It's a plane. Okay, so, so it is a plane. And let's just stop and think about why it might be a plane, rather than just a line, or rather than generating all of R3, generating the entire volume of R3. All right? And what you might notice is that that third vector is a linear combination of the first two vectors. Right? The third vector is a linear combination of the first two vectors. So it doesn't really make any contribution to uh, the set which is generated by it. So um, that third vector, what is it? Minus 1, 3, 1 is equal to 7 times by 1, 1, 1 minus 2 times by 4, 2, 3. Right? So this over here is just a linear combination of these first two. I mean, we could rewrite it. This one's a linear combination of those two, or this one's a linear combination of those two, but let's just write it down like this. I think it's the easiest way to do it. And that means that if you had a new set, let's just call it S twiddle, right? If you had a new set S twiddle, which was just the set 1, 1, 1, and 4, 2, 3, right? So it's the same as our previous set S, except we've kicked out one of its members. We've kicked out minus 1, 3, 1. So if S twiddle is equal to that, then the set which is generated by S twiddle is the same as the set which is generated by S, right? You don't get anything extra by adding in a linear combination of these two vectors. It doesn't let you generate any new vectors, right? Because if you could use it in generating a new vector, you could just have replaced it by the linear combination. Okay, so the, just adding extra vectors into a set doesn't mean that it starts generating a bigger, a bigger subspace. I'll be with you in a moment. Um, the notion that's going to be important is, and this is what we'll speak about in the next sort of lecture and a half, is we want to add linearly independent vectors in, and that will start generating bigger subspaces. Yeah, you've had, you have a question. Um, if we get a set Uh, it depends exactly what the what the problem is, but you'll see one of the things that we might ask you is um, is a particular set a basis for something else? And a basis means that it generates that thing, and that all the things in the basis are linearly independent. And then you you would, but if we just asked you, does this set generate this other thing? Then you don't need to check whether or not they're linearly independent. You just need to check whether you can can reach everything there. Okay. So let's take a look at one more example, and then we can maybe start. No, we'll take a look at a couple of examples. Um, so we're going to work now in uh, the space of all functions, right? So not all functions, I guess all functions from the reals back into the reals. And we're just going to try to think about uh, suitable generating sets for um, subspaces of V.
we've got V is a space of all functions from the real numbers into the real numbers. T is going to be a subspace of V, and it's the subspace which is just all the polynomials of degree 2 or less. So we're going to do a couple of things here. So firstly, I'd like you to check that T is actually a subspace. you check that it is a subspace and then I want to give you I want you to, to, to find some sort of set which generates T. And there are an infinite number of sets that generate T. Try to find what you think is in some way the simplest or maybe the smallest set that generates uh, that generates T. subspace, so f and g are both polynomials of degree 2 or less, so the easiest way to write a polynomial of two degree 2 or less is something like this, let's just say um, a2x squared plus a1x to the 1 plus a0, like that. So that's a polynomial of degree 2 or less. And g of x is equal to, let's call this b2x squared plus b1x plus B naught. So we've got two functions in the following form, and those a squared, a1, a naught, those constants, b squared, b1, b naught, those constants, could be any real number. Now what we have to do is we've got to check that when we add f to g, we get something which is in the same form. It's got to be a constant multiplied by x squared plus a constant multiplied by x plus a constant. Yes? Um, when you add them and you're trying to prove, would you still say you're proving vector addition? Yes. Um, I mean, it's the addition of two functions, but that's fine, because in this space, the vectors are functions. So when we say, well, what is this new function or this new vector f plus g of x, we said that f plus g of x is just going to be f of x plus g of x. And f of x plus g of x is going to be a2x squared plus a1x plus a0 plus b2x squared plus b1x plus b0. And we can rearrange the terms, and we can write this as a2 plus b2x squared plus a1 plus b1x plus a0 plus B naught. And A2 plus B2, that's the sum of two real numbers, we can just call it C2, the real number. So we'll call that C2x squared plus C1x plus C naught, right? Where we've just called A2 plus B2 C2, we've called A1 plus B1 C1, we've called A naught plus B naught C naught. Okay, so this new vector that we formed, this new vector F plus G, has this form here. And this is the form of a polynomial of degree 2 or less. So we're happy that the space is closed under vector addition. Yes? Uh, I think we, we have a previous example. I think it's very similar to this. Mm -hmm. uh, in that example, we only need one Yeah. Just hold on to that thought for a moment. All right, we'll, un until we get to part two. Okay. So uh, this over here, I said uh, f plus g is an element of t, so it's <coughs> so it's closed under vector addition, and you can check for yourself that it's closed under scalar multiplication. 
but basically we just multiply through by alpha and then we'd get something like alpha A2, which we call D2. And alpha A1 we'll call D1 and alpha A0 we could call D0, yeah. Using variables like A2, A1, and A0, uh, which could be any real number, is yeah. necessary to prove scalar multiplication? <coughs> Isn't that included in the set? Um, no, you should still show scalar multiplication. I mean, I guess it just means it's very obvious because you have a real number times by a real number is still a real number. Yeah. Okay. So this is closed under vector addition. Uh, check scalar multiplication. Yourself. Okay. So we are happy that this is actually a uh, subspace. So the second thing that, oh yeah, there's a question. Um, is there any reason that you would check um, scalar multiplication and vector addition separately <coughs> the first thing in one? If you want to, you can do it at the same time simply by looking at linear combinations and showing that the subspace is closed under linear combinations. It, it doesn't really make much difference. I mean, generally, maybe linear combinations is a tiny bit harder to show, but then you only have to do one thing instead of two things. So uh, it's, it's, it's basically the same. All right. Uh, are there any questions about part one here? Okay. So part two. All right. So what, are, what is part two? We've got to find some set S which generates T. So does anyone want to make a suggestion? I think the, the, didn't you, you, you made a suggestion for a, for a set S that would, was going to generate T. Oh, you thought it was a, no, no, no. So, uh, what you were saying might be an answer for the second one. So, uh, forget about that. Does anyone else want to want to make a suggestion for part two? I think we can try out x to the n, where n is greater than equal to two. Why greater than or equal to two? We want it to generate two or less. This is, we want those like those x to the power one n. Mm -hmm. So it can't be less than two. I think the n can't be less than two. Okay, so you want something like x to the n, but n can't be less than 2. No, no, it sounds to me like you're generating everything except what we want. <laughs> okay. Um, does someone else have a suggestion? Yes. Okay. Okay, so your suggestion is we take something like this. Let's just zoom back in because we're going to start writing. So we take uh, so we just take something like this, mx plus c, and let's, let's just make it. Now, now we really want to work with just a specific set, so a, a specific uh, equation of a straight line. So let's just take the simplest straight line we can think of, x, and let's just take the simplest um, polynomial that we can think of, x squared. Right. So can we, can we generate all the polynomials of degree 2 or less using these two functions? No. Why? Why not? So there's something that we, we need a constant as well. Okay, right. So this is very close, but we actually just also need the constant function 1. Right. So we really need three separate things over here. Okay. So if we were to take a linear combination of this now, we would take, say, alpha times by x squared plus beta times by x plus gamma times by 1. So that's alpha x squared plus beta x plus gamma. And that is a polynomial of degree 2 or less. And every polynomial of degree 2 or less can be done in this way, right? So uh, now if we were to take this over here, this would be the set, you know, uh, let's say alpha plus beta x plus gamma x squared, alpha beta gamma element of the reals. And that, that does seem to be T as we as we desired. Yes? So does the constant have to be 1? Does the constant have to be 1? No, the constant doesn't have to be 1. Okay, so th that was the next thing I was going to ask. I mean, is this the only set which is going to work, right? No. I mean, there are an infinite number of sets that will work. We could, for example, have made this, uh, I don't know, what, what is this easy to change into? 31, uh, 4x minus x squared. 
And that will also work, right? And in fact, we could have made it uh, even more complicated. We could have said something like 1x x squared, and we could have added something in over here. There was just a linear combination of the other terms, and that would still work, right? But in some sense, and this is what we'll be talking about in the next couple of lectures, this is the best way to do it, right? That's the smallest number of vectors we need in our set to get all of um, T, right? There's no reason for us to, to think about, you know, the smaller, a, a, anything bigger than that, right? Let's use the, the, simplest, the simplest possible set to generate the space of all the polynomials. Is everyone happy that this one x, x squared does generate all the polynomials of degree two or less? <coughs> okay. And you're also all happy that there might be other sets that generate the polynomials degree two or less. All right. Take a minute and think about what is the biggest set that will generate all the polynomials of degree two or less? What was that? All possible polynomials of all degrees of degree two or less. Okay. So the biggest set which generates T is T itself. Okay. So if you've got a subspace, the biggest set that generates that subspace is that same subspace. A little bit strange. Why, why would we want to generate something from itself? But that's, uh, that's what it is, right? So maybe it's worth making this as a comment uh, or a remark. Right. If you say what is generated by this set and the set you're looking at is a subspace, it just generates itself. And that's because we know that a subspace is closed under linear combinations, right? And when we say generated by, we're just saying all possible linear combinations. But we just said that it was closed, so all we can get is the subspace itself. All right. So I'm going to move now to the next section. We're going to start talking about linear independence, and we'll have enough time to get through probably just the definition and maybe one very small example. But it's really important that you, uh, that you really understand the definition of linear independence. And whenever dependence, whenever you're asked to check whether or not something is linearly independent, you've got to come back to this the definition that you will use to check whether or not something is linearly independent or dependent. Okay. So we start with let S equal some set here, V1, V2, up to Vn. Let S be a subset of some vector space V. If we can find scalars <coughs> alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n, right, same number of scalars as vector combinate, as, as vectors. So if we can find scalars alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n, so that, and we have to have two conditions that hold, so that firstly, alpha 1 v 1 plus alpha 2 v 2 plus dot 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 plus alpha n v n is equal to the zero vector. So if we can find scalars so that we can take this linear combination and the linear combination is equal to zero and, and this is very important, this second point, at least one of them is not zero, right? Because obviously we could do this just by setting alpha one equal to alpha two, equal to alpha three, equal to alpha n. If they were all equal to zero, then obviously we'll be able to make a linear combination equal to the zero vector. That's maybe not very, very interesting. But if we can find a linear combination which is non-trivial, and by non-trivial I mean there's at least one alpha which is non-zero, then we say that the set then the set 
S is linearly dependent. And the definition for linear, linear independence is basically exactly the opposite. So we're going to start with the same set, we're going to find the same linear combination, and if the only solution, let's say, that makes that linear combination equal to zero is the trivial solution, then we have linear independence. Right. Um, if the only solution to uh, alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus plus alpha n v n equals to 0 is the <coughs> trivial solution. And what I mean by the trivial solution is just that we say alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 is equal to alpha 3 is equal to alpha n, which is equal to 0, right? So that's the only solution we can find then we say that this is a linearly independent set. that an unqualified yes, because then people want to think about that as the definition. Uh, an alternative way of thinking about linear dependence and independence is that if you've got a set of two or more vectors, and it is linearly dependent, at least one of those vectors can be written as a linear combination of some of the others. But uh, I mean, this definition here for linear independence and dependence works if you've got a one vector set. It's not clear what it means to speak about linear dependence of a one vector set if you're thinking about it in terms of can I write it as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. So this is the definition. This is what we actually use. But yes, there's an alternative way of thinking about it. Um, uh, which is basically that S is linearly dependent if at least one of the vectors in the set, at least one vector in S is a linear combination of the other vectors. Right, except this is not as nice to work with because it's not really obvious what we mean with linear dependence for a set that only has one vector in it. How can we check whether it's a linear combination of the other vectors? You have to have some sort of intuition about what it means to take a linear combination of no vectors, which is maybe a bit weird. So we don't think about it. Okay. So I don't think we have time to do an example, but I do just want to scroll up and make the following observation, which is that if we were to go back to, let's see, where is it? <laughs> Have I gone too far? Yeah, no. Th if we go back to this set over here, um, this set here, S, would be linearly dependent. Right? And it's linearly dependent. We said that one of them was a linear combination of the others. And that's just the same as saying that if we took minus 1, 3, 1 times by 1, minus 7 times by 1, 1, 1, plus 2 times by 4, 2, 3, that's equal to the zero vector, right? So we've found some coefficients, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 at least one of those coefficients, in this case all three of those coefficients, are not equal to zero, 
and that linear combination adds up to the zero vector. So this is exactly the definition of linear dependent. So we would say that that set S that we started with is a linearly dependent set of three vectors. All right, enjoy your weekend.